A big part of my fantasy for running or playing D&D involves a game world and a story that is always moving, even and especially while the players are doing other things. I want the players to feel like the world is really running on its own and that everything will happen according to natural laws and that the people they meet in that world have enough complexity and depth to make decisions and form opinions on their own, allies and enemies alike. I want the players to feel like the world will keep moving without them, but with their involvement, they can steer that movement away from disaster. The feeling I get when I'm playing a video game and the characters really seem to have their own lives, routines, and dreams of their own lets me engage with that world in a profound way. And like any good feeling I get from games and other stories, I want to share it with the players. Hello. I'm Skylar the ADHDM, and I've gone about accomplishing this goal in a lot of different ways. I've filled out entire notebooks with NPC profiles. I've gone through them week by week and determined how each and every one of those NPCs would react to the events of the previous session. If that sounds like too much work, it definitely is. I've recruited friends to run important NPCs or entire factions behind the scenes, and while that is easier, it runs into the same typical scheduling and communication pitfalls that normal D&D does. I've tried using random tables, and while that generates information I need and usually inspires me, it rarely feels authentic. And I usually end up writing my own thing because I'm unhappy with the rolled result. And of course, there are always setting books, like Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, and Mythic Odysseys of Theros, to name a few of my favorites. And those contain most of the information you need to run a living game in those settings, but familiarizing myself with that and then properly utilizing it can be pretty overwhelming. If we were all perfect, omnipotent super DMs, we could create a sandbox of such depth and potency that every action the players took would subtly change the game and we'd never forget anything. If you are an omnipotent super DM, uh, please let me play in your game. For everyone else, how can we create the feeling that the game world lives and breathes beyond the session and outside of what the player characters witness? And so, in an effort to do as little work as possible between sessions and let all the decision making happen at the table with the players, I start by asking a single question. If the party was never born, if the heroes never arrived in the story, what would happen? More specifically, what would happen if there was nobody there to interrupt the villain's goals? We can still have heroic NPCs fighting and dying in the name of justice, but ultimately, the prevailing assumption in D&D is that if the party falls or fails to act, the bad guys win. That's the tension of the game. We cannot predict what our players are going to do, but we can decide everything that we need to know ahead of time about our villain and what the darkest timeline looks like. That darkest timeline is what I'm calling the adventure clock. The clock starts at zero, which states the villain's primary goal. For Strahd von Zarevich in Curse of Strahd, zero would state, Strahd is looking for Tatiana's reincarnation. Again, for Severin from the Tyranny of Dragons storyline, Zero would say, Severin seeks to return Tiamat to the world. For Bowser in the first Super Mario game, Zero would say, Bowser wants to imprison Princess Peach, the only person capable of reversing his spell. For Dracula from Castlevania, it would simply read, Dracula wants to usher mankind into a new era of darkness. For Darth Vader, it would say, Vader wants to eliminate the rebellion and unite the whole galaxy under the rule of the Empire. The example we'll use today from a game I'm actually prepping our beat zero is Baitor, an evil general and servant of the Unseen Empress, is searching for the hand and eye of his mistress. My Vecna is different. As well as a perfect host body, so she may once again take form in this realm, ushering in a new age of cruelty and destruction. Next, we just list out the steps he's going to take to accomplish that in our darkest timeline. Step 1. Pytor's scouts find the perfect host within a coastal village. She's a paladin with considerable physical and magical prowess. 2. Pytor's army arrives at the village. The paladin rouses the villagers to fight, and they are overwhelmed. The paladin is captured, and the village is destroyed. 3. Pytor sends an elite force to ambush a royal bodyguard with a magic dagger that can steal memories. Four. Vitor uses the magic dagger on an uncooperative sage and learns the locations of the hand and eye. He also gains some of the sage's spells. 5. Vitor and his forces sail to the undersea city where the hand is sealed. 
well, they sail close to it. But then he goes undersea. The Wicked Knight descends into a pocket plane where he must face challenges to win the hand. He emerges victorious. Merely possessing the hand grants him new power. 7. Bitor teleports his forces to the monastery that guards the eye. They destroy the place and claim the eye. 8. Bitor returns to his keep, transfers the eye and hand to the paladin, and the unseen empress walks the earth once more. None can stand against her, and the dread general sweeps the land. Hello, Editing Skylar here. I forgot to mention that one of the benefits of listing out the villain's step-by-step -step plan like this is that it gives us some scenes to work towards. Each beat on this adventure clock is something I can play out in my head like a movie, something that gets my blood pumping. When I'm prepping the game or writing a story, I think about what the awesome climactic thing is that's about to happen, and then I fill in the spaces between that thing and how I'm going to put the players in as an obstacle. Just writing out these 8 beats on Bytor's adventure clock for this video has already put characters, locations, and magic items in my head. And I basically already know the bare minimum things I'll need to prep for those confrontations. Okay, interruption over. Back to video, Skylar. This is not an outline of our adventure, unless the party decides they want to ignore the conflict and open a hot dog cart. The adventure will start at or a little bit before beat one. The party finds themselves between the agents of the villain and the object of the villain's goal. Whatever the result of that conflict is, we move the clock to the next beat. Both the villain and the game world at large will react to these events. Now, in our blank spaces beside the darkest timeline adventure clock, we will write a small summary of what actually happened. Maybe the party ran into the scouts, but one of them got away. Maybe the scouts were killed, but Bytor knew where they were headed before they vanished. Now it's up to the party how they want to prepare the village for the impending attack. And it's up to you to decide how everyone is going to react to that. We have three tools to help us make these decisions. At every beat of the adventure clock, we update the resources for our villain and for the party. For the villain, this includes anything you want to keep in mind when you're throwing new threats at the party. Anything from a pricey contract with an infernal assassin, magical artifacts, a special poison or curse, a favor owed by a powerful entity, or a, an elite force in his armies. For the party resources, we can include not only things we want to keep in mind when designing encounters, like that they have access to flight or teleportation or someone has immunity to a given damage type, but also things that we want to help the party remember that they haven't cashed in, like forgotten magic items at the bottom of the bag of holding or alliances that they haven't reached out to. I also use this as an abstract way to check game balance. If the party's resources far exceed those of the villains, we probably need to give our villains some new resources if we want to keep playing the game. If the reverse is true, uh, the party could probably use a lucky break and some new friends. The next tool is our consequences. This is where we track what we want to happen to the party the next time we advance the clock as a result of their actions. If they've disrupted the villain's plans once more, or they've angered a given faction or otherwise incurred a narrative or literal debt that they haven't paid, we can write that here. Stealing from a god's shrine, snubbing an invitation from a really influential NPC, or openly breaking the law can all go in this box, and we'll have it all in one place when the other shoe drops on each of these incursions. There can be good consequences too. If the party actually gave to a god shrine, if they helped a stranger in need, or they freed a unicorn from a hunter's snare, we can cash these in to help the party in their time of need. When I'm looking at what consequences are coming directly from the villain, I look at the villain's resources and see what they'd be willing to expend to deal with the party during the next adventure beat. For example, that pricey contract with the infernal assassin could come into play the next time the party settles down to rest. Maybe those elite soldiers could go after one of the party's most valuable allies. The more desperate the villain gets, the more severe the resource expenditure. A good way to determine how desperate they are is to look at where you are on the adventure clock. On the left is what the villain should be doing, if it wasn't for those meddling kids. On the right is where they are. The further behind they are on their goals, the more resources they're willing to expend. When they reach the final beat, the time when they would have completed their goal in the darkest timeline, that's usually, for me, when the villain will say, I guess I have to do this myself, and our boss fight occurs, and all remaining resources can be deployed in that fight. And our last tool is called the Relationship Tracker. We list each faction in the game world. I try to limit these to 
four at a time for a given campaign unless I'm playing a really politically complex game. And we can track how everyone is feeling about the party. No need to make a villain faction for our big bad. We know how they feel about the party. Each time the adventure clock advances, we take stock of how everyone feels about what the party has done. In our example, if they defended the village against Baitor's minions, we can increase the relationship score for every faction that approved of that. I try to limit it to a single increase or decrease for the faction the party interacted with the most, but sometimes it's appropriate to make multiple adjustments. I also try to move in increments of one point at a time, but if something really drastic happened, I would definitely adjust it by more. The scale I have goes from minus four, outwardly hostile, kill on sight, to plus four, loyal allies, we've got your back. After you've made those adjustments, we can go down to our factions grid, and for every faction you adjusted, go down the row and adjust every other faction by the listed amount. When we set this up, we just have to think about how these groups feel about one another. Imagine the party bargained with goblins in the forest to gain passage. The villagers, who have lived their entire lives in fear of the goblins would not approve of this. In this case, for this game I'm running, most groups feel either neutral or moderately positive or negative about one another. So the relationship scores either stay the same or change by 0.5 one way or the other. In a more politically complex game where appearances are everything and everyone has a hidden agenda, these scores might adjust more harshly. If I were running a game like the Iliad or the Odyssey, and I set it in Theros, where the gods have rivalries and schemes and they meddle in mortal affairs to upset or appease one another, it would be great to make a grid with all the gods on it and track their flighty favor and displeasure with our relationship tracker. Sometimes the party does things between beats that are worth a reaction, so I leave some extra squares to tally those totals. Our relationship tracker is also a wonderful place to scan for consequences. If the party wronged an ally one too many times, they might withhold aid or shelter. Neutral factions, once their score is made high enough, can be recruited by the party. Or by the villain if their score is really low. So to recap, we outline the villain's goals in the darkest timeline. The world in which the meddling kids stay home. In our adventure clock. We decide what resources the villain already has to accomplish their goals. We do the same thing with the party, although at the beginning of the adventure they probably won't have much. We then fill out our faction grid to see how all the powers of the world feel about one another and decide how they feel about the party at the start of the game. The villain makes the first move, the clock strikes one, and the party is standing in the way. That's our adventure hook. After however many sessions it takes to resolve that conflict, we take a look at what resources the villain and the party may have gained or lost, what consequences the party has incurred and we adjust the relationship scores for the factions the party has already interacted with. Finally, we look at how the other factions feel about that adjustment. I don't tend to have the other factions react to negative relationship score adjustments, but you totally can just invert the adjustment listed on the grid. The only reason that I avoid it is because I like to keep it really simple. So all of this will give us a two page spread that captures in one place the ever changing state of the game world. Anything on this page that you want to go into more detail on, or you need more space for notes, that can get its own spread elsewhere in the notebook. This used to be six different spreads in my notebook. A relationship tracker, party resources, party consequences, villain goals, villain resources, and an adventure outline. But I wanted to see them all together and adjust them at the same time. In my experience, tracking these kinds of resources together and making them dependent on each other makes for a world that the players feel is real and alive even when they're not looking at it. But also, like they have a real effect on this world and its other denizens. I'm trying to go a video without saying the V word, verisimilitude, but it really fits here. So that's the two page adventure clock spread. I'm including a PDF link and a public post on my Patreon, anyone can download it. I'll link that in the description, on our Discord, and on Twitter. If you use this in your game, I really, really want to know how it went. You will almost certainly want to make some changes to suit your needs, and I would really like to know what those changes are. You can tweet pictures of your version, or how you filled out the faction grid, or what your darkest timeline looks like with your villain's goals, especially if you're putting it in your notebook by hand, double especially if you're using a pencil, that would fill me with very good feelings. If you want to see my design process for this spread, messy handwriting and all, there's a patrons only post as well. Thank you to my antediluvian lurker and dungeon delver tier patrons. 
Adam M, Iron Trash, Troy, Borkware, Courtney Monster, M, Mitch B, Raspalicious, Sam, Sean S, and Sean M. And thank you, as always, for watching.